And I can, I'm sure there's a good evolutionary account of why that would be the case. Certainly if I was a, a slightly nervous hominid living in, the, in West Africa, or something like that, or where, where in France, with Leon here perhaps right now, um, 50,000 years ago, dark, everything was dark, it was pretty scary. Most of the people, members of my species died young. Um, most of the females died in childbirth. Most of the males died either at the hands of another man or from complications caused by badly designed dental arrangements. People died from infections due to tooth decay, apparently. Um, if I was in that kind of an environment, I would be scared most of the time, I think, for good reason. And I would be on the lookout, I would be constantly vigilant. What would serve me really well in that environment would be an, a, a, a visual system that could very, very quickly give me information about potential threats without necessarily giving me too much information about the details of them. So anything that moved or flickered or suddenly came to appearance or loomed um, to one side of me, I would need to know about it as soon as possible. Information about exactly what that was or what colour it was and so on would be less important. I could conserve resources by not having that information made available to me until I and chose to, to uh, become focally aware of it. So this is, I guess is a kind of evolutionary account of, of why that difference would take place. But in terms of its use as metaphor, what is the... Uh, it does that sort of difference in how visual perception works and how different parts of the eye work. That kind of fine, relatively fine-grained detail translate across as entailments into the general metaphor to do with seeing, particularly knowing is seeing, which is the one that I'm looking at here. One possible application of it, I'm thinking, it's not, I'm not sure if this is a metaphor, if this is directly related or not, or one observation of that is that um, one of the way in which things come into awareness is in the way that I've just described in that sort of narrative of Neanderthal or Habilis ancestors is that what, what things tend to come to knowing that when, they can, when things begin to be known they begin to be known in a kind of shadowy looming moving um, coarse grained way things appear at the, core, at the periphery of our vision and they appear just stripped of detail, but containing movement and containing um, non uh, sort of, uh, ontological presence, and and it's only subsequent to that does, does the details start to accumulate, and and things like colour and form and, and the presence of edges and so on start to be added to that visual that initial visual stimulus. Perhaps that, project, perhaps that trajectory is, is kind of reproduced in our understanding of how knowledge accumulates or how knowledge is, is initially aware. It becomes, uh, comes, to, comes to our awareness, if that's the right way of looking at it, I'm not sure it is. So perhaps when we first come across a piece of knowledge, how we conceive it is we conceive it as kind of mobile and kind of um, flickering and tangential and peripheral and moving in and out of existence. And perhaps it's in competition with lots of other grey, shadowy knowledge forms, barely perceptible, right at the edge of our knowledge. And it only, it's only when we turn our cognition in the direction of that knowledge make ourselves more focally aware of it, bring it to the centre of our attention, perhaps through educational processes, that other kinds of um, structures 
Um, quite a lot of structures become available to that knowledge. So that knowledge starts to have edges. Or that has to it starts to be sort of coloured. Or it starts to um uh starts to be seen in relationships. It starts to be more solid.